Welcome everybody. I'm Walter Isaacson and I'm welcoming you to the third in our annual our series of New Orleans Book Festival virtual book discussions. Uh, we're going to all gather in person, put it on your calendar, March 18th to 20th of next year, when we're going to actually do the book festival at Tulane. But we've been doing this series of virtual meetings as a wonderful walk up to it in a way to keep everybody's mind active during uh, these strange times we're living in. The next of these virtual book talks, by the way, is in a couple of weeks, and it'll be myself and another native of the city, uh, Michael Lewis, in conversation about each of our works. We're each gonna get to question each other like we did as kids. But now, today, we have something that's far more interesting than that, which is a panel on race in America. Of course, nothing could be more timely. And the authors that we have uh, on this panel are the best possible to discuss it. And then to moderate this panel is a person with deep uh, ties to New Orleans, uh, Michelle Miller. She's the co-host of CBS uh, This Morning on Saturday. Uh, she joined the broadcast in July 2018. She's been on the CBS Evening News, CBS This Morning, CBS Sunday Morning, and also as a correspondent on 48 Hours. She's reported on all sorts of stories of national and international importance, including the unrest in Ferguson following uh, the death of Michael Brown. She covered Sandy Hook, the shooting in Newtown, uh, Connecticut, uh, also the shooting at Chardon High School in Ohio, and has been on the presidential trail in 2004, 2008, and 2012. She got her bachelor's degree from Howard University, studied abroad in Kenya and Tanzania, and she holds a master's degree in urban studies from the University of New Orleans. Her broadcast career began, where else? WWL-TV in New Orleans. She's also taught journalism courses at Dillard University here, and she is married to former mayor Mark Morial, who will be a speaker at our book festival. She's got a book coming out, Michelle does as well, and so does her mother-in-law, Sybil Morial. So it's my great pleasure to turn this program over to my friend and somebody I've admired for a really long time, Michelle Miller. who is on mute and so I'll talk until she hits her mute button. I know, I was taking my lesson from you earlier. Walter, you're the best, you really are. Um, thank you for giving um, uh, such kudos to both um, my husband, Mark, and on his book, uh, The Gumbo Coalition, which just recently came out, and of course, Witness to Change, Ms. Mo, Sybil Morial's book. Um, you know, we have writers in the family. Uh, and hopefully, you know, one day I'll produce one. <laughs> so thank you again. Um, I'm really glad to be here. This is an important discussion and, and it comes a week after uh, uh, six days uh, I spent in Houston covering uh, the memorials of George Floyd, the funeral of George Floyd and this uh, movement that has uh, taken uh, us on a conscious journey uh, about race and racial justice, not only within the United States, but around the world. Over the last month, we've seen this country er erupt in conversation, in uh, outrage, in a new or renewed understanding. And we're calling on institutions because there is a reckoning taking place. Systematic oppression uh, within our systems of government, within our systems of policing, within our systems of criminal justice. Um, we, are, we are engaging in a conversation like never before about what racism is. We're at a tipping point, some might say, and conversations like this hold a lot of power, which is why we have decided to gather this illustrious panel. So I'm gonna start with the gentleman in the tie, looking rather dapper with all of those fabulous books behind him. Eddie Glaude Jr. is an intellectual who speaks to the complex dynamics of the American experience. His most well-known books, Democracy in Black, How Race Still Enslaves the American Soul, and In a Shade of Blue, 
pragmatism and the politics of Black America. You are deep, Eddie. Take a wide look at Black communities, the difficulties of race in the United States and the challenges our democracy face. He is an American critic in the tradition of James Baldwin, I'm told, and Ralph Waldo Emerson. And his most recent book, Begin Again, James Baldwin's America and its Urgent Lessons for Our Own is scheduled for release, for release rather on June the 30th of this very year. So big kudos, let's give him an honorary clap, clap, clap. All right, thank you, Eddie. Cleo Wade, whoo, she is, Amazing, a friend, a community builder. I like that she said a friend, a friend and a community builder and an author of the best-selling books, books, Heart Talk, Poetic Wisdom for a Better Life and Where to Begin, a small book, Your Power to Create Big Change. She has been called the poet of her generation by Time Magazine and one of the 100 most creative people in business by Fast Company. She sits on boards like the Lower East Side Girls Club, the National Black Theater in Harlem, and the Women's Prison Association. A wide array of interests there. Cleo Wade, thank you so much for being here with us. Woohoo! Last but certainly not least is Kiese Lehman. Oh, Southern Black writer, born and raised in Jackson, Mississippi, attended Millsaps College and Jackson State University. He's the author of, of the novel Long Division and a collection of essays which, um, and in the Undefeated, New York Times Publishers Weekly, NPR. It is one of those books, and I just lost my more recent note, that was named by Audible's Audiobook of the Year and also one of the best books of 2018 by the Undefeated, New York Times Publishers Weekly, and NPR. So we thank you. Brother Heavy. Let's thank Brother Heavy. <laughs> the Heavy, the Deep. Thank you. I believe in applause because right. what you're doing, I, I'm assuming as writers, that y'all had something to say and you had something to say early on. And I'm just curious, you know, as writers, what, what is it that you are hearing right now being said? What is this moment that is being, what is being voiced in this moment? Anyone can pick <laughs> it up from there. Uh, go ahead, kids. I want to hear what you have to say. Uh, I'll just be brief. I mean, I think we're hearing a cacophony of voices and sounds and words. Um, one of the things I think we're hearing everywhere is no more. And I think ironically, like, you know, the title of Eddie's new book, Begin Again, what I'm hearing a lot of people say is like, let's collectively begin again, begin again um, with suffering, the end of suffering as the goal. So I'm hearing a lot of things, but I'm definitely hearing no more, let's begin again, let's eradicate suffering. And concretely, I think we're hearing a lot of folks say that black folk have made to carry an unfair burden and how do we repair the history of what it takes to tote too much weight. Among other things, I'm hearing that. Cleo? Uh, you know, one of the, the interesting things uh, about right now is that you are hearing a lot of people saying things like, what can I do or how can I help? And if you're a black person with any white friends, you've gotten that text from them in these past few weeks. Like, what can I do? What can I be a part of? Whatever you're doing, I'm down. Or what are you building? Like, who are you supporting? I'm ready to support them. And it's been really interesting for me because, you know, this is a time of great and incredible action, but it should not be a time that is without reflection. And so whenever I feel like I'm getting those messages or those texts or the people who want to pour all of their energies outward, which yes, yes, hell yes to that, I also tell them, you know, what are you gonna do about you? You know, like what's, what's the personal inventory you're taking in your life? You know, how do you plan on reclaiming, you know, the heart and mind that you possess um, that built this world before you woke up to these uh, atrocities, 
do you know? And so I think that in that we have to say, even to our loved ones, you know, I had the conversation with my baby daddy two nights ago and I was like, what's your business look like? You know, yeah. what is, what does your industry look like? And where you hold all this power, where are you making sure that black and brown faces show up? And I'm not just saying like, oh, we put the call out and nobody, nobody, uh, sent in their resume, where, where are the gaps? Where do they, we get to the point where someone doesn't even have a resume? And so I think that when we, you know, it's interesting this time to, to, to really ask people to reflect on their, their personal lives, not just say like, yes, we're joining the fight to abolish and to fund and we're, we're rolling with campaign zero and we're supporting the NAACP, but it's like, yes, but also like, what does your kid's school look like? You know, what is, what do your friend, what are your gatherings of your friends look like? Um, what do your kids' schools look like? What do your, your workplaces look like? What do the boards of your, that you're on look like? Not even just saying like, oh yeah, all those big companies, those boards, you know, there's, everyone's doing something in their community in some way. You know, what do those spaces look like? And so I, I, I've really been asking uh, people to really reflect on, on, on their very personal actions in, in, in their lives. Eddie, I, mean, know, he, yeah. I was just gonna say, Kiese, he, he brought your book in with, without even uh, pointing That's because I love I mean, it. it, it it's, it's love, much love, right. Yeah, so here, here, here's this book that you just published or is about to kick off and it, it couldn't be more relevant. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's actually quite, you know, quite, quite amazing, you know, one of the things that I'm clear about is that the prophetic voice isn't about the future. The prophetic voice is about telling the truth in the present, which opens up how we imagine the future, you know? And I think there's something about what Jimmy was struggling with post uh, the assassination of Dr. King that offers us some languages and vocabularies for our own current moment. But, you know, I was sitting here grab thinking about the answers to your question and and how I might answer it as a writer, what, I'm, what am I listening for? What am I hearing uh, beyond slogan, beyond uh, the kind of political uh, clamoring? What am I hearing? I'm hearing um, language of brokenness. I'm hearing suffering. I'm hearing a desire for a full of me fuller meaning. I'm trying to figure out as a writer how to, to, to give voice to uh, the anxiety around the end of the American empire and what people are groping for, uh, trying to give a voice to this latest iteration of black suffering. How do we talk about accumulated suffering and accumulated grief? I'm trying to make sense, trying to figure out a language to talk about tears in 2020, mm. right? How to, how to describe it, right? How to, how to account for it in the eyes of a child or in the eyes of, of, of a mother holding a child who's grieving over the loss of, of her husband in, in the sense, in the case of Richard uh, Brooks and that press conference. So there's, there's a sense in which I'm trying to figure out as a writer how to, to grapple with the familiar, the constant and, and the new and the different, right? And, and how to get my pen on that and how to get my mind around it you know, um, you know, Jimmy has his line in, 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 in The Fire Next Time, where he says, for the horrors of the American Negro life, there's seldom been a language. Hmm. And he's using that to set up what the Nation of Islam, how the Nation of Islam functions. But in that way, he's talking about what, as writers, how do we put our pen? How do we bring our pen to bear on those experiences in this time? That's what I'm trying to figure out in this moment. You know, for me, I'm, I'm a journalist. I'm what they call, I'm the historian of today, right? So I'm, I am talking about what is currently going to be written about in the future. And I think about this, this phone, and I think of us bearing witness on these atrocities, what these quote unquote alleged crimes, because are they alleged? Someone died. Um, there's, there's a perception here that, you know, the rule of law is what it is, and, and yet our hearts are telling us, our minds are telling us what we see is, is, is unimaginable. And, and why is it just now 
uh, why is it just now we're seeing it this way <laughs> and it's impacting us this way? Kiesi, Kiese? <laughs> I mean, I think there's a lot of whys, but what I think we're seeing is the culmination of like multiple institutions. Um, and I'm just gonna talk about family, religion, uh, schools, um, police, if we wanna look at the incarceral system. I think all of these institutions incentivize a particular kind of cowardice. Do you know what I mean? Like I think cowardice has been incentivized, cowardice has been credentialized, um, cowardice often, um, has been subsidized. And so, you know, beyond all of this other shit, I think like at the core of what we've seen is our, our people thankfully saying that I, I, I know that you have, enc have encouraged me to be a coward. I know that it takes a lot of courage to get out there in the streets in the middle of a pandemic and, and demand change. But if not now, when? And I, what I think we're seeing is people not knowing if there is going to be a win which is so important for us to understand what Jimmy was talking about in terms of yesterday. But, but ultimately, I think what we're seeing is the culmination of what happens when the institutions that we've deemed the most valuable in our culture incentivize cowardice. Mm. Eventually, thankfully, I think people say no more. That's some of what I see happening. Cleo, is everyone asking, does democracy apply to everybody? You know, and and we're in a, an, a we're in an election year, uh, and we are seeing this happen not just in Minneapolis. Then it happens in Texas, and then it happens in Atlanta, and and this is with the knowledge that it's in full view. It's almost as if it's being pushed in a way to for, for you know for the system to say I don't care because you know what <laughs> I'm immune. I'm immune to the law. In, you know, in, I, think, I think a lot of what people are reckoning with right now is like you said that it is in plain view it's always been in plain view there is no history book you can look in where you do not see the most grotesque police brutality on the planet happening in this country and so I think that what people are really reckoning with personally uh, specifically white America is this has been in plain view and I refuse to look at it and now somehow I have melted whatever that barrier was inside of me that refused to look at something. And now I'm looking at it. And in that, I think that, you know, white America's crisis is that they're finding, you know, the cowardice in there. I think they're finding the shame in there. And I think that it's, it's a lot to handle and move through. And, you know, this is what happens when you spend generation on generation on generation never recognizing your neighbors or their struggles or their pain or or what go, or, or what goes on in, in their lives and at the hand of your other neighbors or your family members or you yeah eddie i i'm going to go to ernest sneed's question and it it's it, it points out the time we're in right now and he asked uh, with the recent georgia voting experience what is the current role of the federal government in protecting voting rights at a time when we're like on this powder keg? Well, I mean, the current role of the federal government is, is in some ways has been dictated by Donald Trump. And his understanding, uh, along with, I think, the folks who are interested in him having a second term, is, for the, is to deny voting, is to I, I said that we need to be prepared for the three C's with Donald Trump, and that is he's going to carpet bomb Biden with oppositional research. He's going to stoke the culture wars, and he's going to cheat. And what we see very clearly in Georgia is the cheating. Uh, it's, it's voter suppression. It's, it's the way in which uh, this is going back to a, a, a feature of the question you asked, Chloe. Is that, that Cleo, is that, that is democracy is not instantiated in this place. It's not. So, you know, it is, it is, it is under assault. Its foundations are, are crumbling right in front of our faces. So to ask what the role of the federal government is now is to understand uh, uh, the federal government's role in actually denying uh, access to the vote. And we just need to be clear about that. It seems you know, to me. 
Yeah, no PSA. Do you have a comment on that? I mean, I I, I agree. <laughs> My comment is, is is I agree. I mean, you know, deep, d deeply, I I I I should not ask this question, but you know, I think publicly, every time we get an opportunity to ask this question, we have to ask our ask this question. I'm a writer who is obsessed with introspectively critiquing the worst parts of myself and asking myself what the worst parts of myself have to do with this nation. And hmm. additionally, like what do like the most joyful, potentially sublime parts of myself have to do with this nation? So I am a self-critical writer, right? This is not a self-critical question. At some point, we have to ask ourselves, what have we as a nation done to enable the majority of white voters in this country to support a man like Donald Trump. Because as singular as he is, as spectacular as he is, as easy as he is to talk about us, and I think he had some help getting elected far from white folk in this nation, but why would the majority of white Americans elect that man? That's a question that I don't even like talking about, but every time we get an opportunity to speak, I think we have to ask that question because at the root of that question, is the inverse of what white folk have asked me my entire life. What is wrong with you? You come from a single parent home. What is wrong with you? What is wrong with white Americans? What is wrong with white Americans? And I'm not gonna spend any more time in my art trying to fix them, but I hope, I hope white Americans are really taking that question to task. So is that the question they're asking themselves and they're the ones who have to ask it? Because we've answered it. <laughs> the best over. of us have answered it over and over again. <laughs> You know, I've read Cleo's work. Cleo has answered it. Eddie has answered it. I've attempted to explore an answer. Jimmy answered it, you know? But at some point, they have to ask themselves, what is wrong with us? What is wrong with us? And, 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 and why does our perpetual investment in harm and suffering and disruption hurt not only the least of these, but just completely mangle our ethics and morality? They have to ask themselves that question at some yeah. point. Tucker Brock is asking, do you believe equality for all races in America is a possibility or deeply ingrained structural foundation to prevent that vision from being a reality? Whoa. Cleo? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I think it's a dream worth having. Um, Certainly, I, I think that it's the goal. I think that it's something to work towards. I think that it's something to, you know, work towards as you dismantle, dismantle those systems that keep it from being possible. But, you know, I think that, you know, we have a language problem in this country too. I think that we use words we, and we don't know what they mean. I, I don't think that when people say is equality possible, a lot of the times, we're talking about the same word when we say equality. And I think that that's, that's hard. And I think that's a lot of our conversations need to be around, you know, are we saying the same thing when we say these words? Because these words get hijacked and start to mean a million different things to a million different people. And, and that is a huge source of oppression as well. well what does that word mean? Who's hijacking it in what way and what does it mean in this sense? Well, it all depends on who you're talking to or who's talking. So for some people, equality means equality with white people, right? right? It's to say that white, whiteness becomes the measure of one's standing. Whitening, whiteness becomes the, the basis by which one is extended dignity, right? And is distinguished as someone deserving of being accorded respect, right? And so we live in a society that has been organized along the view that if you're not white, you are subject to ongoing disregard and devaluation. And so if the frame is set, then equality gets read as simply being equal to them. And so we know that that frame, once you concede to that frame, you're caught. And oftentimes it, 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 it also evidences itself in this way as well, where racial justice and equality becomes a philanthropic enterprise. Mm. Something that white people can then give to others. It becomes mm charitable it becomes an act of charity in a way and when that happens we're caught again and but you know the question is not to be equal to them who are they to be equal to 
And we need to be very, very clear when we talk about white people, Jimmy makes this wonderful distinction in the evidence of things not seen between white people and people who happen to be white. He says he happens to love a lot of people who happen to be white, and then they're white people, right? Wow. And, and those, and that's a, it's a very important distinction. Folks who are invested in this ideology, who are willing to quit NASCAR because he can't fly his Confederate flag, you <laughs> see what I mean? That's an investment in an identity of whiteness that has tangible, concrete consequences, right? So instead, you know, there's, I, I'm sorry, I've been, Jimmy's in my head. He has this wonderful line in this essay from The Liberator where he says, I want us to do something unprecedented to create a self without the need for enemies. Mm-hmm. Now, that seems to me the basis for a robust conception of equality that I'm, that I'm willing to commit you know, myself to. It, this is a lot to untangle. You think, okay, we've been living under this for 400 years. It is going to take a long time, a lot of work to untangle. Uh, someone told me, a white person told me, this is lifelong therapy for white people who have to witness their whiteness. And I just, it, it's, how do you gather the strength to be in this movement? Because, you know, for us, we're, we're in it. It's not our responsibility, but we're in it. Is this the beginning? I mean, how is this different? This goes along with that. Ms. McClung's question about, you know, how does this compare to what we saw in the 60s and, and the ability for it to last and endure? I mean, I think we have to accept that, that, that all of us, um, for better and often for worse, have been in this movement for at least 400 years, right? Mm-hmm. That's the thing about inheritances. You don't just get to choose what you inherit. Right. So we, 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 we have all been in this. And, and at different times, I would say that regardless of race, class, gender, sexuality, place, like we have all allowed ourselves to be bought. We've all in different times allowed ourselves to be co-opted by those forces that we would call evil. I'm from Mississippi. I talk about evil. Do you know what I'm saying? And so, like, I think if we say, is this the beginning? I mean, I, I think you're starting from a, from a, from a, from a, from a sort of like, I believe in surrealism. I write surrealist fiction, but that's a surrealist question. The beginning did not start with us. It didn't start with my grandmama. It didn't start with my great grandmama. It didn't start with my white students, great, 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 great grandmothers. We are in this fight. And at different times we have been on the same, same side, like, like encouraging a particular kind of suffering. And at different times, some of us are blessed with a lineage of who, who a lineage who has fought back. Do you know what I'm trying to say? And so I, I, I think it's important, this is what Imani Perry encourages us to do often, is to realize this is, this, is, this is a long fight. And I think when people hear that, they think, oh, going forward, it's gonna be long. In the spirit of Jimmy, in the spirit of Imani, I think what, she, what she's also saying is, we are part of a long, 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 long struggle. All of us, all of us, all of us Americans. And I think all of us humans. And so like, how do we reckon with the beginnings of that? And the hardest part is like, how do we reckon with the part of us, the parts of our lineage who have not, who have, who have made the, the imperative of other people suffering the most important thing in the world? And I think right. we understand that. I think we then can start to break inheritances and start to veer in different ways. But I think if you start with this belief that, you know, it starts now, I think that's just another reiteration of these progress narratives that a lot of people, including James Baldwin, would push back against. Yeah, you know, Karen Rappaport asked this question, what do you think of the current idea of changing Confederate street names in favor of recognizing New Orleans musicians? Now, this is a subject that um, one of our organizers, Cheryl Landry, was very familiar with. Her husband, like, went in hard on this, got those monuments, those Confederate monuments, you know, taken out of the city or off public property. But it reminds me, this is one of my most favorite memes or IG posts and and it like crystallized this moment for me. It said, if someone kidnapped your child and sold them, where would you want us to put the statue of that person? And I was like, I wish I had the mind to have put it that way in argument after argument after argument. So really, isn't that what it comes down to? You know, to quote my favorite sign I've seen on the internet, (laughs) 
fuck your statues. <laughs> <laughs> Perfectly honest. And Hello. And to quote my favorite meme, and that's how I feel about the street signs, and that's how I feel about the schools named after it. I don't give a fuck, to be honest, if I'm just being real. You know, and I think that like, what we can contextualize is why those were put there, but I don't think that they deserve to stay there for that context. So I think that there's other ways to contextualize how we as a people ended up in a, well, didn't end up strategically, were put in a space where these oppressive names and statues and street names and uh, school, you know, school names were surrounding us. Um, but I think we can learn about it in a book. But are, I will read that book to my child. But Cleo, are, I mean, or all of us here, are, are people being honest with the heritage uh, argument? I mean, are they really being honest about oh. that? Saying uh, heritage? No. You know, they're, they're, I mean, because then they don't really know the origin or the history of, 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 of that which they're speaking. But, but let's just let you, let me just say how, let me try to figure out or say how crazy this is. I grew up on the coast of Mississippi in a small town called Moss Point. And mm -hmm. I was in the eighth grade. And my favorite general of the Civil War was Stonewall Jackson. What the hell? My favorite general was Thomas Stonewall Jackson. His vibrant personality, his irreverence, his military genius that the Confederacy lost because he was killed, mm. right? What, what, what is happening in that moment? It shows that the lost cause wasn't actually lost, it actually won. And it shows how a lie, which is at the heart of a certain kind of Southern imaginary, right, serves as the armor, right, for a certain kind of racist ideology that continues to overdetermine the very air we breathe in the South. So much so that a black child on the coast of Mississippi could celebrate Stonewall Jackson. That's sick, right? So part of what we have to understand is the facts of the matter are such that we need to reveal this as the lie that it is. It's not heritage, right? You're celebrating traitors. You're celebrating treason. And it's not just the South. It's at Yale with John C. Calhoun and Yale's uh, we don't want to exceptionalize the South. It's not just the South, right? As Malcolm X said, as long as you're south of the Canadian border, you're in the right. South, <laughs> right? So, so part of what we have to do, we have to understand that the truth is the precondition for reconciliation and repair. And the only way that we can tell the truth is you got to confess to your, your commitment to the lie. Yeah. So as we have this debate, it becomes the occasion for confession. And if you can't confess, you can't be forgiven. Mm -mm. Here I am echoing Jimmy again. But anyway. <laughs> I, I want to say, can I get an amen? <laughs> amen. Amen. <laughs> yeah, so, so can the movement, can a movement of reconciliation then begin? Or should it begin in the South? Where should it begin? Or is, is it begin? I mean, it seems like it's everywhere right now. I'm, but do I'm, you need I'm, that truth and reconciliation like you saw in South Africa? It sounds like that's what you're saying, Eddie. Uh, absolutely. I mean, I, I mean, I would argue that the move, a movement for reconciliation, has 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 started and restarted and restarted and restarted in the South. Do you know what I'm saying? Um, and 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 what I would want to just echo is that you know. It's ill that Eddie Glaude at one point held up, you know, Stonewall Jackson. But I come from Jackson, Mississippi. And I tell everybody I'm proud to be from Jackson, who was named for Andrew Jackson. <laughs> My mama got a little bit of money. She moved, like, to the outskirts of Jackson to a place called a reservoir, which was named for Ross Barnett, proudly. And this was a race woman. So, so, so what, what, what I'm trying to say is that, again, to go back to what I said earlier, I think we are incentivized to be humiliated. We like, you know, that there's an incentive for us to accept a particular kind of humiliation. And that's what I think those symbols really, 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 really imbue, a particular kind of humiliation. But the, but the, but the, but the most dastardly part about this, and I just want to locate this in the South, 
is that we are not a, a, a region that is bereft of very real heroes, particularly if you invest in any sort of Christian jo doctrine. Fannie Lou Hamer is the hero. Ida mm. B. Wells is the fucking American hero. So if you choose to put an armed soldier somewhere, or you choose to, 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 to herald any of the Jacksons or Ross Barnett, you are, you are not just making a, the wrong choice. You are choosing evil in the face of like sublime joy and black majesty. And I just think we have to call it that. You know what I'm trying to say? Like these motherfuckers are the best of humanity and they happen to be from the belly of what people call the beast Mississippi. So I just, yeah. it, it's on and on and on. It's, it's a fight that they fought and, the, and some of their great, great grandmothers fought and mom grandmother fought. And hopefully if I have children, my children will fight but I just want people to, 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 to understand, no matter what you think about the dirty, no matter what you think about the South, we have the best, greatest models of American heroes in the world. The problem is why don't some of these white motherfuckers like hoist them up? Because they know, because or, evil or, is real. Right, but Kia said, or like a Newt Knight who, I mean, you know, arguably was a white Confederate who deserted the Confederacy and, ran into the swamps and realized, mm, this ain't right. <laughs> they, I, I'm fighting somebody else's war Absolutely. and I'm losing my land in the process. Yes. Um, like I'm a poor farmer. Why am I fighting in this war? I don't have any slaves. And then went on to become a radical Republican in defending African-Americans. I mean, there are people, there were tons of Confederate deserters, some because they just deserted, but others who had, uh, you know, interesting, interesting ideas about race that didn't jive with the popular culture, so to speak. Mm -hmm. But and we just, I, I, they make it easy for the neoliberals. Let me just say something like, like their existence beyond like what's happening down here, like the existence of these like neo-Confederate monuments and blah, 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 blah. They make it easy for like the neoliberals to be like, we're not them. And that might not be something we want to talk about right now, but I, I just want to- By the way, that was exactly what I was about to talk about, is that what I think is a little dangerous about the question is, of can the movement for reconciliation start in the South? I think the South is an incredibly unique place, you know, being from New Orleans myself. So unique places require unique storytelling that, that works for the, that space. But it's dangerous because what ends up happening, and I know that every single person on here right now knows at least one person who has bribed themselves, tried to bribe them and themselves into thinking that Donald Trump isn't really racist because he's not from the South. You know, and people, I've had that conversation where some people like, you know, the weirdest thing is, is that it's all fake, right? I mean, he's just doing this to get elected because, you know, he's from New York. And you're like, no. Like, New York you know, Martin place. Luther King said he never saw racism in its most evil way until he went to Chicago. Mm. So, so like that is real so it's like I think a lot of the times when we do try to say you know speak specifically to the south and really I think we need to speak uniquely to the south um, mm. and the cultures of the south mm. uh, you know it, it does give way for people to be like you know I'm not that you know I'm not that I'm not the, the southern KKK hooded mm -hmm. ancestor you know I'm not that that type of racist and, and I think that that is how a lot of the white people in America ended up voting for Trump and thinking that's like, he just does that. You know, he's not really like that because he's from up there. And you're like, no, he's like that. <laughs> he's, very, he's very like that. <laughs> right. Elliot Gould is asking to everyone, but he says particular to Kiese, um, when sincere reparation has been made to black people in this country, what will it feel like in your body? So we, we now we open the pan the Pandora's box of reparations, which is a whole that's we could go off in a whole um, direction. Yeah, but I'll, I'm just saying, there. what would it feel like in your body? I mean, I I I I I'll, let me just say what I feel now. What I've always felt as a young black boy and what I feel as a black man is safeness. I just think it's really important to like add words that don't exist. Safeness. I felt safeness as a black child growing up in Mississippi, though I know and I knew we did not have access to a kind of structural safety. So I, I would assume in that, that, that reparations, the way this question is asking, would lead to a kind of structural safety that would, for example, make me feel like if I'm driving at night and I happen to hear 
you know, um, a police car, I won't have to automatically turn my phone on, text my mom or anything like that. But, but, but I think the important part of that question for me is that I don't think reparations would give me, me and, and the people who I call home, like dignity, because we already have that. And I don't think it can provide a safeness because that is like one of the wonders of black folk, particularly black folk in the deep South, like a safeness already exists. But I do think economic and structural and health particular safety is something that 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 like I don't know what it would make my body feel because I haven't I never experienced that in a long in a in a in a in a, in a, in a, in a real tangible way but I have felt a safeness. Yeah, Eddie. Uh, someone asked you uh, the fact that you speak of whiteness as default culture, which he says or she says is now shifting. He's asking or he she's asking. Can we also hear a bit more about the business of philanthropy? philanthropy around blackness, racism, et cetera, right now? Um, I don't quite understand the question in, in, in one sense, right? So the, the business of philanthropy around blackness? Yeah, I don't uh, get it either, so. I mean, look, I think there is there is this idea where one can perform one's bona fides by, by, by in some ways performing a certain kind of liberal orientation to the question of race. I think this is what Casey and, and, and Cleo were hinting at around how the statues can become an easy, an easy out, right? That is to say, we only look for the loud racists <laughs> um, and then those who, who are content with their segregated neighborhoods and you know all of those parents in New York who didn't want uh, their schools to be desegregated and they came out and and really went at the, the chancellor because they were talking about uh, bringing in more black and brown kids into their school districts, um, that those folks who donate to NAACP and National Urban League, shout out to Mark, um, um, that, they, that they, when it comes down to their private lives, are making choices that actually reproduce the very inequality that we're talking about. But they, they write their checks, right? They, they, they traffic in a kind of racial sentimentality when it comes to our, to, to our lives and to the question of racial or racial justice. And so there is, there is a kind of uh, philanthropic approach uh, by white liberals, a philanthropic approach by, by white America, a philanthropic approach by black leaders, uh, hmm, um, uh, where folks aren't really invested in a kind of substantive shift in the center of gravity of how we live together, how we be together, how we exist together. You know what I mean? If I mm -hmm. understand the question, I'm not quite sure. Well, that I got that was a right. good answer. It, I, that was a really good answer because um, <laughs> breaking that one down, <laughs> I just asked the questions as they're written. Here's one, it, the sort of reference is like what we're talking about uh, in terms of allyship and, and whether or not it's sincere or genuine. Uh, do you think brands like PepsiCo and Band-Aid, diverse colors finally, are being genuine or is it all just marketing? I, I'd love to hear what you say. I, I know the answer to this, to at least one of those, and I'll, I'll offer my answer once you all have your say. I just saw Cleo look way oh. up. But I, I, I just, Cleo has to say about that. <laughs> I had I was like well I already was buying brown digits so like I wasn't buying band I haven't been buying band brand for a long time so I, you know um but I, you know I think that again it, it I think there's no way to have say one general I, I don't think there's a way to generalize like what every type of company and space is doing right I think you can certainly tell when it's not genuine and I think you can certainly tell when it's um when the timing's uh, right the action is based in a desire to keep the business afloat and not you know create real equity and uh um you know better the conditions for for uh, for the pe for people in this country so i mean i think to me i i'd have to say it's like case by case because i i feel you can right. certainly tell when it's not i guess well, you know, it's interesting. Uh, in January, I started on this uh, story about skin tone inclusion. And the Band-Aid and several of the brands, like the one that you spoke of, that, 
you know, they came in different hues and there's from lingerie to band-aids to any one of a number of things. But what's interesting is that Johnson and Johnson that came out with and then shelved their brand did not want to talk to me. And now today, I believe, or perhaps yesterday they came out with, oh, we're marketing these, these band-aids again. And I thought it was very Why interesting. We, they've been around for a hundred years. That is, it is not a a new brand that's just like oh because like listen i know a lot of entrepreneurs and you're like okay when we first start this is what we can these are the color ways we can afford to get in because of production restraints etc this is a hundred year old brand you know audrey lord was writing about band-aids like you know <laughs> it, it, this is not something that it, in the 80s you know this is not something that has is been a that we have not been talking about or seeing or hasn't been the example do you know what I mean? Well, for, Trevor, for Noah, what? Trevor Noah came out and said, we got an Elmo Band-Aid before we got a black one. <laughs> right. And I'll leave it at that. Right. Um, I, I have another question. The questions are just rolling through. And these are two questions at the same time from two different educators. Jody Hester says, uh, as an educator, I'm extremely clear that the students I'll see in my classroom this fall are not the same students I saw in mid-March. I know I'm not the same. How do I prepare myself to speak and teach again? How do I find voice through literature to speak to this time in the lives of my students? I'll let Kiese take that one. Uh, again, that's a, a, a humongous question. And I think it has a lot of answers. Again, like I, I, I believe that educators often have to lead with the histories of our bodies. Right. So if that questioner assumes that she is not this or they are not the same, I would like I would have loved my teachers to talk to me about why they're bodily, intellectually, spiritually not the same. What happened over the summer for you? I think sometimes we have to model like the we have to model not just confession, but we have to model like what Baldwin called like our first acts. We have to model like going backwards and understanding who we thought we were. And, and talk about that confrontation with blank that made us different. And so I would just hope that all teachers, and, I, and again, I'm not in classrooms in eighth grade, 12th grade, ninth grade, fourth grade, but I would hope that all teachers could model a messy attempt at reckoning at the start of every semester and possibly every class period. Um, because I think that like holistic reckoning connects is not just navel gazing and if it is navel gazing it's connecting my navel to cleo's navel to eddie's navel do you know what i'm trying to say and, and so I, I would hope that the teachers would be willing to do that and i know that's what i need to do as a teacher but i'm also aware that the work that i do is very different than the work this incredible work this super important work that people are that the teachers are doing on the middle middle grade definitely preschool and I would say even high school, but I just, I, I would hope they are unafraid of doing the work to connect their transformations or lack thereof bodily, intellectually with the bodies and intellects uh, in their classroom. So, so Eddie, I'm gonna ask you, uh, this, this gentleman says, how can I as a black community college professor in a very white school help administrators and faculty to accept that there is a problem? So no acknowledgement, it sounds like here, uh, I've been fighting this fight for over 20 years at this school. I no longer want to hear about their diversity program. Mm. I mean, we're fed uh, up, aren't we? Yeah, I just want to hug that brother. Yeah. I understand. Um, I, I, you know, it's a very hard question to answer in, in this sense, right? Um, Whatever space we find ourselves in, uh, you want to build it. You at least this is how I approach it. I want to build something that that fourth that that young that young black sister in the fourth grade will have something to come to. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So I want to I want to affect the institution I inhabit in such a way. I inhabit in such a way. I want to affect it in a way that when she arrives, she will have a space that will affirm her that will give her uh, uh, the means and the space to not only dream dreams, but to acquire the skills and resources to make those dreams a reality. Now, oftentimes that, times that kind of labor uh, is, is exhausting, it's soul crushing. Mm -hmm. And you can just throw your hands up and just say, fuck it, right? 
I actually cursed. I joined. I know. I joined I the group, you. right? You got right? You. Hey, I got my little I'm holding out. I'm holding out. I did it. But, you know, at some, you know, the, the labor can be intense and exhausting. You could find it soul crushing. But if you think of it outside of yourself, mm. right, that it's not about not about you fighting them and trying to get them to see X and Y and Z, but how you inhabit an institutional space in such a way that you can actually change and morph it such that that child who may end up there will actually have a space that is more affirming, more loving, more nurturing. So I think I want to say to the brother uh, that uh, it's hard that you can actually shift your center of in, your your focus uh, in trying to get instead of getting them to see to see the problem, figure out how to leverage your social capital to build something that will be sustainable, irrespective of whether or not they will they will acknowledge it or not. Because you know what, Princeton can never pull up African American studies. Mm. We built it in such a way that it is nested mm. in the very way the institution functions. So to pull it up, too many roots will come with it. Mm. You see, so, so in other words, if you're inhabiting an institution, figure out how to institution build, not for your own aim, but for that young baby who's coming along in a couple, in a couple of years or a decade or so. Feel that. Cleo, Cleo, speaking of language here, is, have you heard any language recently used that you found frustrating, inaccurate, you would edit or better represent by capturing it in a different way? Have I heard language that would what? So is there any language people are using? I, I know allyship or an ally, that, that was one that really ticked some people off uh, last week, I heard. I mean, is, is there the, the semantics or the vocabulary we're using at this time? Is there anything that pushes anybody's buttons in a way that, that they feel is, is either misused or inappropriate? I you know, I, I think, again, I just, for me, I try to make sure people know the words they're using. So, and, and so that's pretty, that's where more I focus my energy. So I'm, I'm kind of like, well, when you say ally, what do you mean? Like, what does that mean to you? And, and for a lot of people, I mean, I, I, a lot of people talk about the difference between an ally and an accomplice and how times like these really require more of an accomplice and an ally, someone who's willing to get into the trouble with you, not witness your trouble. Um, and so I do think that allyship ends up being more of a witness than an, an active, um, uh, a witnessing word more than an active word. And so I, um, you know, I, I challenge people, I, I ask questions about the words they use rather than judging the words they use or, um, mm -hmm. or saying, I don't like that word you use. I, I'd rather know why you want to use that word and what that word actually means to you when you yeah. say it. Like, what do you mean? I gotcha. I like that. So we have like five minutes. I have a final question to each of you. What book would you recommend for people to be reading right now? Dun, 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 dun. Hey, I'm going to seem like a Homer fam, but uh, <laughs> I got to go with Begin Again. Begin Again. It's not even out, but you can pre-order it now. I pre-ordered wow. it last night. And, and, and let me just say that this is why it's a cheat answer. I think, I think if you read Begin Again, you necessarily have to read um, the books that made Begin Again possible, right? Begin Again is, 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 is singular in that it, 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 it is a literary feat that I've never seen, but it's a singular literary feat that is very deliberately open about all of its predecessors and traditions that made it possible. So Begin Again by Eddie Glaude is a book that I would say people should read and read the books that made it possible. So Eddie, if I if I if I could get up, I would do my holy dance. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, you know, thank you so much, Casey, for the love, bro. I really appreciate it. You know what I would suggest? I would say read No Name in the Street to echo mm -hmm. something he said. And the reason why I would say read No Name in the Street in 1972. This is James Baldwin. It's the first book Jimmy publishes after the assassination of Dr. King. He does some interviews, you know, you get the, 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 the newspaper articles, the little throwaway pieces, but Jimmy actually has a nervous, you know, had basically collapses. And by 69, he tries to commit suicide. 
And so he's trying to figure out how to pick up the pieces in the face of the country's betrayal. What does it mean that the country has killed Medgar, Martin, and Malcolm, or Malcolm and Martin? How does, what does it mean that the country has turned its back on the promise of 63 and 64 and 65? And what does it mean that he spies Ronald Reagan on the horizon? He sees the country and what it's doing. He finds these resources in no name that I think are resources that are really useful for us in our own moment in this latest iteration of the country's betrayal. Cleo, two minutes. Uh, you know, I think I'd probably say maybe a burst of life by Audrey Lord. And and I think I think also I would why are y'all laughing? That's, no, <laughs> that's, that's I dope. I like it. And 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 I, I, I will also say to that and is something that you know, one of my best girlfriends, Stevie, and I talk about a lot, we talked about last night is, you know, during this time, also, you know, it is great to everyone's going to pre-order how to be an anti-racist and, and yes to those, yes to those books, but don't forget about the black arts, you know, because during this time, um, it is a beautiful time to read memoirs, like heavy, and, heavy. and, and read and read black and and read black artistry and soak in that and understand that because again, so much of the the, the troubles of the times we are living in is the lives we've had ignored, and so memoirs are a beautiful way to intimately get to know those lives. Poetry, read Lucille Clifton. You know, those are beautiful ways to become intimate with the black experience, and during these times you know, the arts are what help us, yes, you know, the arts are what would help people to imagine more than what we see. And, and I do think that this time is going to require your greatest possible imagination. And I don't think you can really get there without the arts. And so, you know, as you're get, as you're, you know, stocking up on, on all of, you know, your African American history books and and, and, and all of the how-to books during this moment or, or white fragility and, and all these books, just don't leave the arts out because that is really how you understand our humanity and our lives and our relationships and the things that make us beautiful and special and joyful and, and alive and human, truly human, and not something that is just a case to be studied. Yeah, and on that note, on the memoir note, the semi-memoir, The Gumbo Coalition, I would recommend by Mark Morial. <laughs> 10 lessons, 10 leadership lessons to help you inspire, <laughs> unite, and achieve. How about that? Uh, Kiese Lemon, Eddie Glaude, Cleo Wade, the uh, amazing club that is Tulane University Events and the NOLA Book Fest. I, I thank you for allowing me to be here and moderate this illustrious panel. I so in, look forward to seeing you guys next year. How about that? 2021, March 19th, is that right? I think so, March 18th, March 19th, I think so, yeah. There it is. Thank y'all so much. Thank y'all. Thank, thank you.